Right. Hi, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining this session. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, and hopefully by the end of this session, Asher will be demystified for you. So uh, let's just start with a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Emilia Erani. I'm based here in Oslo, Norway, uh, and I'm a data, data engineer, uh, but I do like the sweet spot when I can also be a technical project manager. So uh, a little bit of a control freak uh, with a passion for data. And uh, when I'm not geeking out about data magic, I uh, train for 10Ks. So I started that in September, uh, and um, I'm working on my personal um, personal best for this October, actually. And I also do like to watch TV shows uh, X number of times. So currently I am re-watching Sons of Anarchy and Game of Thrones. So I guess that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Now, the uh, intention for today, um, yeah, I see that uh, the visual here is a bit off, but yeah. Uh, so the intention for today is that we are going to start on uh, our cloud journey in Azure. Uh, and there are a few steps uh, before that uh, that I wanted to check with you guys. And if you haven't done them, then that's totally fine. But uh, I do recommend you to do these uh, four steps before uh, really embarking on your Azure journey. So the first step is uh, doing a requirement uh, capture. Uh, this is just to gather all of the business needs and use cases that you have for your cloud platform. Uh, it will create a bit a better overview of uh, where you're going and uh, what you need the platform for. Uh, and also keep you in line so that you don't create a uh, huge uh, amount of stuff in the cloud that you really don't need or see the benefit of. Um, I also assume that you have done an extensive cloud provider analysis and also chosen Azure. Uh, but fear not if uh, you haven't chosen Azure or you haven't done the um, cloud provider analysis, then it's fine. Um, the cloud is structured um, in somewhat the same manner. So you will learn a lot today and you will also be able to take that with you if you go for another platform. Um, and then based on the point number one from the requirement capture, you should create a requirement roadmap. That means just uh, setting the, the pace for what should be developed first and also uh, what should the aim be for the platform. So what, what I'm trying to do here is just to make sure that you don't create just to create and, um, uh, and that what you create actually have a uh, purpose. And it also keeps the scope small enough so you don't um, so you don't become overwhelmed of how much you can do when you move into the cloud. And then, of course, we need to do an alignment uh, within the company um, so that everybody is uh, on the same page on why we have chosen uh, a cloud platform uh, and also what this will entail for the different employees within an organization. And with that, let's take a look at the agenda. So we will start with a super quick overview of uh, how Azure is structured, just to make sure that we are on the same page uh, and we have our terminology in check. And then we will start to look at how we can structure your single tenant. So uh, we will not be looking at multiple tenants or hybrid solutions today, but a single tenant. Uh, when we have done that, we will uh, get our access control under control before we move on with uh, establishing a naming strategy uh, for our resources. And last but not least, we will look at what Azure policies can do for our tenant. So let's just kick off with the first point, a quick overview. Now, um, the Azure uh, Cloud Platform is divided into regions and availability zones. And what that means is that uh, even though you're moving to the cloud, we still need some hardware. And that hardware is uh, something that Microsoft is responsible of. And that hardware resides in different parts of the world. And now what is great is that you are able to choose 
uh, which part of the world you want your data and solutions to reside in. So you can pick one of the spots here uh, as your uh, chosen region for your resources. And then within that re region, you also have uh, what we call availability zones. So within one region, we can have uh, multiple availability zones. Um, and the point here is that um, if, there, if there are some unforeseen um, disasters that happen to one available, availability zone, um, that will not affect your solution uh, because Microsoft will then um, make sure that your uh, solution uh, still runs within another availability zone. And uh, within each availability zone, we have uh, at least one data center. It could be more. And that data center is the hardware that we are talking about. So this is where you uh, have everything that you need in order to store uh, and also have compute power to do your transformations and so on in the cloud. Now, what's good about this is that you don't have to uh, think about maintaining that hardware yourself because Microsoft is responsible for that. And so that's one of the neat things about uh, going to the cloud. Now, moving on uh, within that, um, when you have picked a region and you also chosen how many availability zones you want to play on, um, you uh, have uh, to set up a tenant. And a tenant is, uh, it can be a little bit hard to uh, get a grasp of. Uh, so uh, what it is, is basically the organization that owns and manage a specific instance of Microsoft Cloud Services. Now, that doesn't exactly mean uh, that much more, uh, at least it didn't to me when I first started. So although it might not be 100% correct, we can say that uh, a tenant is the equivalent of uh, a directory. So a tenant can only have one directory. Uh, and the directory that we are talking about here is the Azure Active Directory. So um, what you can say is that when you uh, when you log into the portal, um, everything that you see in the portal is your tenant. And then you can have uh, Azure Active Directory dictating what you are allowed to see and what you're not allowed to see. So, but uh, but the the tenant itself is the whole world where you can uh, create resources and structure your subscriptions and so on. And then we have something called management groups, and also management groups are just a logical uh, grouping of uh, subs subscriptions, resource groups and resources. Uh, we will talk a bit more about that later, uh, but there's always one management group within each tenant and that is the root management group, but you could also choose to have multiple. And then the subs uh, or the subscriptions, uh, those are in place for the billing purposes. Um, so when you create a resource, you must uh, have a subscription and that subscription will be connected to how you are being billed for the services that you have uh, in your platform. And then within uh, each subscription, you can have either one or multiple uh, resource groups where also the resource will reside. So Super quick and, uh, quick and efficient overview of how the Azure tenant is, um, is structured there. And then, you guys, we will dig into how you can structure your single tenant. Now, let's start with the management group. So what I said earlier was that you always have one management group. Uh, you can't choose not to have one because uh, it is mandatory. And that management group is the root management group. You won't see it uh, or know that it's there, but it is there. Um, and then in addition to that, you can choose to have multiple uh, or additional management groups that will be connected to that one root management group. Now, what I've done here is I've, um, I've tagged uh, or I've created the management groups for the different departments within an organization, just as an example on how you can um, structure or set up the management groups. It does not necessarily mean that this is uh, the best case for your organization, but it's one way to do it. 
Another way to do it is to think of um, the management groups as the sub uh, companies within one giant uh, company. Uh, so I've chosen to take IT uh, out on the side here and, and say that this is going to be, um, uh, be one IT department for all of the, the sub companies, but we do want one management group for each uh, sub company. And this is mainly just to enable us to have a better access control of which people are uh, getting access to the different sub uh, company um, management groups and also uh, subscriptions and resource groups as well. So when we look at that and we add, yes, sorry, and then you can also add um, management groups within that sub company and uh, then the total number of layers that you can have uh, management groups within one tenant is six. That is six. Um, in addition to the root management group. So in total, total seven, um, but you're only able to create six levels um, of management groups. And then within uh, the management groups, you have subscriptions. And like we said uh, earlier, uh, the subscriptions is um, directly connected to uh, the billing of your uh, usage on the cloud. So uh, you will always have one subscription, but you could also add multiple. And we usually uh, add multiple subscriptions to um, to logically uh, categorize resources or resource groups that are um, that we want to be separate from from other environments. So let's say a development environment and a production environment should logically be separated by two uh, subscriptions, and that is just to make sure that. Uh, whatever happens in the production environment is not affected if we made changes in the development environment. Um, so yeah, but you could choose to have multiple subscriptions within one management group, and you can also choose to have just one. It all depends on uh, what is um, what is what makes more sense to to your organization. And then uh, finally, within those uh, subscriptions, you can have uh, multiple or a single uh, resource groups. Now, the fun thing here is that you have an unlimited number of subscriptions per management group. So there's really no restriction on how many subs you can have. Uh, and there's really no restriction either to uh, how many resource groups you can have per subscription because the limit is 980. And I think if you have if you have 980 resource groups within one subscription, then you might want to think about how you can restructure that subscription. Uh, maybe you should turn the subscription into a management group and then create uh, subscriptions for each of the resource groups that you have just to make it a bit more uh, individualized. So yeah, and then um, there are three pitfalls that I would like uh, for you to avoid when you develop your uh, tenant. And the number one uh, pitfall uh, is to go hard uh, and make it too complex uh, right off the bat. Um, what I mean by that is um, the tenant should uh, evolve uh, at the same pace as uh, your uh, platform competency increases so that uh, so that uh, you create or you set up the tenant how it should look according to the business requirements that you established uh, before embarking on logging into the platform uh, or logging into the to the portal um, and also uh, make sure that uh, how you set it up is flexible. So if you want to add a management group, you can do that. Uh, if you see that you need management groups at a later time, then that's also fine. You don't have to create uh, four different management management groups now when you only need one. So that's that's step number one. Do not make that mistake uh, mistake of going uh, into with too complex of a solution. The next one is ending up with a tightly coupled architecture. Now, what I mean by that is a uh, picture that you have three resource uh, groups. 
uh, A, B and C. And within all of these, we have resources that are dependent on each other. Now, this is a tightly coupled architecture. Uh, we cannot delete one resource group without affecting the other two. So what we want is we want to move everything or all of the resources that all, uh, all three solutions are dependent on into one, um, one common resource group that all of the solutions can use. That way, we are enabling ourselves to delete a resource group at a later time if we find that the solution is not uh, going to live anymore without affecting the other two that we still want running. So uh, keep that in mind when you set up the resource groups and, and uh, how you uh, categorize the, the resources so that you don't end up with a tightly coupled architecture. And the final pitfall that we should avoid is create just to create, because you are now able to do a lot of fun stuff when you log into the portal. Uh, so hold your horses and stick to the requirement uh, roadmap that you that you created. And if you do that, you will be fine. All right, so we have looked at the structure of uh, a single tenant. We have looked a little bit of, uh, uh, on how we can use management groups, uh, how we should structure our resource groups and, and subscriptions. And so let's now try to get our access control under control. All right, so I just wanted to start with this picture again because we are going to look at the role-based access for your users. So that uh, is the equivalent of the employees in your organization and we want to give them uh, access uh, to use some of the resources within the resource groups that you see in this picture here. Now, uh, we need to do that uh, and what we don't want to do is start by giving a uh, giving every individual employee their own access to the resources that they need access to. What we want is trying to categorize the employees into groups and then give that group a role access to the resource or a resource group or a subscription, whatever layer uh, best suits you. But we want to avoid giving individual uh, access. So if you're able to look at your organization and you uh, tr can pinpoint the people that will be working on the platform itself, maintaining the infrastructure of the cloud platform, uh, looking at cost, looking at efficiency and so on, then we have the cloud platform team. Great. That's one group that we need to provide access uh, to. If we move on uh, one more step and we try to identify the people that will consume uh, the solutions or the data that we uh, that we make available through the cloud platform, then great, we have another group, the data consumers. Uh, and the third group is, of course, the people that are going to do the, um, uh, the actually data handling uh, and making the data uh, available, creating the transformation and also the data flows. And that is uh, the data producers. So again, I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page. We're not talking about applications here. We're talking about actual users. Um, and what uh, what access those users need based on the role that they have. And to make it a bit more clear, I've also added uh, roles that it's maybe uh, better uh, or easier to um, easier to um, compared to within your own organization. So we have the platform admins under the cloud platform team. Under data consumers, we have business controllers, business analysts, and maybe leadership slash management team. So these are the people that will consume the data and, and, um, and use it for further analysis or, or reporting. And then the data, the data producers uh, being the data analysts, the data engineers and the AI slash ML engineers. Um, 
And it might be easier to, to tag uh, an employee to one of these uh, titles or roles. Uh, so that could also be used uh, in order to try to, to at least uh, create three uh, user groups for uh, providing access. And moving on, uh, we might also see that no, it's not uh, enough with uh, only three uh, groups. We need seven because uh, within one group, uh, we see that the data analyst and the data engineer needs a total different, um, a total different set of um, uh, access. So we need to create those two as their own separate. So instead of three, we ended up with seven. But this is something that will uh, be very clear when you first start working on uh, or trying to map out the different people within your organization and, and which of these, the top three, uh, the cloud platform team, the data consumer and the data producer um, and employees should belong to. But yeah. Now, so being a, a platform admin, uh, we think that this person should have access to everything because they're maintaining the infrastructure of the, the platform. So they will have a lot of responsibility with the access that they have uh, that they have gotten. So keep that in mind when you uh, provide admin access to people. It should not uh, be taken lightly. And then you might have, like we talked about earlier, a different environment for production and development. And it's uh, maybe um, uh, more efficient for the data consumers being the business analyst, the business controller and the leadership management team to have access to uh, the production environment uh, to read the final curated data and use that for, for the reporting. While uh, being a data analyst, a data engineer, and an N AI and ML engineer uh, need access to the development environment to actually do changes to the data that, uh, that we have within an organization. And then there might be um, one case where we have Paul. And Paul uh, is a business analyst. And he uh, runs up to the platform admins and say, hey, hey, I need also access to the, the development resource group, just uh, like the data analyst, the data engineer and the ML engineers, because I'm going to do a lot of cool stuff to the data. Now, the first step for the admin is to check, do you really need that access? And the second uh, step is, do not give Paul individual access to the subscription for the development environment. Uh, the best case scenario here, uh, where we have seven different user groups, is to identify which of the groups for the development area. So is Paul closer to a data analyst, a data engineer, or an uh, AI slash ML engineer? And then add him to that group as well. Now we know that he doesn't have access uh, without a group. And we are also able to remove him from that user group if he no longer should have that access. So that is good. And then um, there are different types of roles. So that is the admin owner, the reader and the contributor for the different uh, or for the uh, three different uh, main categories of, uh, of user groups here. Uh, and that uh, tells us a little bit about what they're able to do. So a reader uh, role uh, is only allowed to read data, while a contributor role is allowed to, to make changes to, to data and also, uh, in some cases, the resources within the resource group. And then finally, the admin slash owner has a lot of responsibility because they have a lot of access. So it needs to be um managed uh, in a good manner so yes and then there are six steps that we could take to make sure that uh, we enhance our tenants access control and the first step is multi-factor authenticity authenticity um, so when you log into your uh, portal uh, you can enable multi-authentication 
which means that when a new user or not a new, but when a user logs on, they have to identify both with uh, the login and password and also uh, a secondary um, authentication method. Um, and that just by doing that, you have increased uh, the security of your platform. So that is very good. The second step is do not have more than five global admins. Uh, this is the best practice from Microsoft uh, themselves um, because, as we've said before, the uh, admin role uh, has a lot of uh, access and a lot of ability to do a lot of dumb stuff to the tenant. Delete, uh, for example, your resources that shouldn't be deleted and so on. So. Do not allow too many people to have that privilege. And the next one is privileged identity management. And what th this means is that you can give uh, users uh, just in time privileged access to uh, your platform. And you can also oversee what they're doing while, uh, while they're uh, in your tenant. So that's also a very neat trick if you, if you want to pay extra attention to, to certain uh, users. And then, like we've talked about in the previous slides, we need to use uh, groups, AD groups, Azure Directory groups for user access. So you will put your employees within groups and then you will give that group a role uh, um, and then providing them access to um, the subscription, the management group um, and so on. Um, and then, Conditional access um, in uh, Azure, we have uh, least privilege, meaning that you only you should only grant access uh, or the access that is needed for uh, the group to do their job. So we don't want to provide too much access to people that don't need it. Uh, and so that's important that uh, that uh, you keep that in mind. Conditional access all the way is key. And you will know when people are missing their access. So uh, give them too little uh, because if they need more, they will let you know for sure. And then the final point is delete inactive users. And uh, this point is uh, combined by two things. Uh, if a person uh, leaves or an employee leaves the company, of course, they should be uh, their access should be uh, removed. I consider that uh, something that should be uh, automatic, uh, but I just need to mention it. Um, uh, but the other thing that I mean is if you see that the person, for example, Paul, that was granted access through the data engineer, um, um, uh, AD group, uh, and he doesn't need that access anymore, then delete him from the data engineer AD group. Uh, because we don't want people to have uh, more access than they actually need. So if they don't use it, they don't, they don't need it. So yeah. All right. So if you do all these six steps, you will have uh, enhanced your tenant's access control uh, by so much. Uh, and it's so easy. Um, yeah. And then, OK, we have now gotten our uh, access control under control, and we want to start creating some resources in our tenant. Uh, but before we do that, we should uh, establish a naming strategy, uh, both for resources, but also for management groups, subscriptions and uh, resource groups. Uh, so let's let's start uh, doing that or uh, at least uh, let you know where to start because it is uh, a journey that you would have to take within the uh, within your organization. So defining your naming and tying strategy. Why do we need it? Uh, three simple bullet points. It will enable you to quickly identify resources. You will know which resource is supposed to use for what if you know the naming convention. Um, it would also make it more uh, simple for management to manage the resources or the resource groups or subscription within your tenant. And you can get a better uh, overview of cost management. And we will go into details on how you can at least fulfill number three 
uh, later on in the presentation. But uh, so, yeah, I think the why uh, says itself. It's better for control and it's better for um, 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 it's better for you, new users on the uh, on the platform to uh, to um, uh, know where to start and where to begin their journey on learning which resource they should use for for uh, which transformation and so on. All right. Um, then moving on to how. Uh, how should we do it? Because when you say, yeah, you need a naming and tagging strategy, uh, you sit there and you're like, OK, but where? <laughs> uh, I don't know how. Um, so these are also three bullet points to kind of lead you on the way, but I do have the answer for you, so don't don't give up just yet. But um, a name uh, of a resource, uh, a resource group, a subscription and management group uh, should make sense. And one way to do that is to include both business and operational details in the name. That being said, we don't want the name to be too long because who wants to read a long name? Uh, it just, yeah, it will just overwhelm you. So keep it sh as short and simple as you can uh, and make it make sense for, for both super techie people and also uh, super uh, or non super techie people. So it might be a good idea to put the two people in the same room with uh, different backgrounds to just to check if does this name make sense or not. And the final uh, tip is create standardized tags, uh, because uh, if you don't want a long name, you can use the tags to give your resource even more detail. Uh, and that, again, can be used for uh, managing your resources. So there's no downside on tags or a naming convention. And then over to the answer on uh, how or uh, where to start. Now, uh, Microsoft has done a lot already, which is nice. So I will uh, copy a link to you guys so that you can just save that for a rainy day when you want to start uh, creating a naming and tagging strategy for your company. So my recommendation for you is to do not invent the wheel um, from start. Uh, try to use something that Microsoft already has spent a lot of time on and just adapt it to your organization. And when you open that link, you might find yourself looking at a page with a lot of words and you think, oh, God, do I need to read the, this entire page. Uh, I, um, I don't think that's what I really want to spend my Friday evening doing. And I also have a solution for you there because uh, Google is your friend when you want to find something uh, fun. And uh, there is this guy um, who has created uh, what I think is genius for uh, <laughs> the naming convention that Microsoft has created. All right, are you guys ready? I hope so. Take a look at this beautiful naming convention periodic table. <laughs> it gives me so much joy to see so much uh, color in one, uh, yeah, in one place. And it all makes sense once you get to know it. So uh, this is uh, this is not the entire list of the resources that uh, that Azure uh, that Azure have, but I, I think we will cover a lot of what you uh, of the resources that you will start your uh, cloud journey with. Um, and on the, I'm going to use this fancy tool here. Uh, on the right side here, you have the categories with the color and the uh, uh, and the explanation of the color. Uh, and what I wanted to to um, uh, to uh, um, yeah, what I wanted to say was okay. So uh, this is the page with a lot of words, a lot of hyphens, and how and where should I start to even try to figure out which resources are relevant for me and which should I use? And so uh, let's just take an example. We, uh, from the beginning of the presentation, we had a management group for HR. Um, 
And let's say that we wanted to create a storage account for uh, that HR department within that HR uh, management group. Now, if we look at the periodic table, we have this dark green uh, called storage. And let's look at the dark green. Oh, there's only two. This is really nice. I want a storage account. So this is going to be this box. What I have here is the abbreviation that will be the beginning of the resource name. So we should name it. Ah, oh, you guessed it right. ST hyphen HR hyphen Prud. By doing that, we have uh, we have uh, shown what uh, kind of resource it is by the first abbreviation. We have included business details in the HR and we have included operational details in the Prud. So everyone, uh, both techie and non-techie people will know uh, that this storage account belongs to the HR department and it, the, it is the production storage account. So please do not delete, in other words. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, we have the uh, length restrictions for each of the resources on the top right corner. So Justin O'Connor has really done an amazing job. And I think uh, just by looking at this, you got a bit more excited to jump in uh, and creating a, a naming strategy for, for your um, platform. If not, uh, I don't believe you. All right, let's, uh, let's see what we have left here. So we have now uh, at least maybe not established a naming strategy, but we have uh, we have gotten some tools on how to and where to start. Um, so let's continue and see what uh, Azure Policy can do for for your tenant as well. OK, so this slide uh, is um, uh, is inspired by Game of Thrones, and I hope you um, I hope you can enjoy the naming that I uh, I felt so creative uh, creating this this slide. Uh, the first or the title of this slide: Enforce organizational standards and assess compliance at scale. That's actually the first sentence in the Microsoft uh, documentation about Azure policies. So. It's not uh, <laughs> it's not only bad reads in that documentation. Uh, it's also very very good and very powerful statements. And uh, Azure Policies is in fact uh, a very powerful tool if you use it um, uh, to your advantage. So the first thing that you can do is so we talked about regions in the beginning of the session and we we said that you can decide yourself which region you want your data and solutions to reside and that's fine uh let's say that you live in uh, within the eu and you have to follow um gdpr uh rules uh, and you want that data that you have and your solutions that you build to be within uh within a region within the europe area um, what you can do is create a region dictator. What does this Azure policy does is enforce uh, you to use only one specific region when you create a new resource. So if you have uh, platform admins out there that want to go rogue and want to create uh, a resource in Australia, for instance, then you can say, no, no, you can't do that because we have the region dictator um, enabled. So uh, this means that you will not be able to create uh, that resource uh, as long as you uh, as long as you put uh, the the region as something else than within uh, the Europe region. So that's kind of a neat uh, neat policy that we um, that I would recommend you to to um, to add to your tenant. The next is the naming champion. So you can actually also enforce your newest, newly established naming strategy with Azure policies. Uh, so you can you can force your employees to follow the naming convention. And if they don't know the naming convention, they would have to learn it. So that's also nice. Otherwise, no new resources or resource groups or subscriptions or management groups. So 
extra cred there um, to, for enforcing that as well. The third one is Lord of Tags. Uh, and just like the naming convention, you're also, uh, you're also uh, able to, to um, make your uh, platform admins uh, add tags to your resources. Uh, because what if you are a platform admin and you want to allocate the cost of, uh, of your tenant usage to the different management group departments? let's say. And then you have 10 resources that don't, that don't have uh, the cost tag that you need or the tag that you need in order to pinpoint that resource to, uh, for example, the HR management group. Then you have 10 resources that you can't, or 10 resource uh, related costs that you can't allocate to, the, to, their, um, to their significant management group. What to do then? Uh, by enabling the Azure policy for tags, you have to uh, add the tag that it, or the tags that are needed in order to create the resource. Um, and also, uh, the policy can also be used after, uh, so you will get the list of all of the resources that don't have tags if you already have a tenant uh, and want to start to create uh, or start to use tags. That's also a very neat trick that you can you can get an overview of all of the resources that you need to do something with in order for them to be compliant to your business rules. And the fourth one is overseer of keys. Um, now there, uh, it doesn't exist. A don't delete button or a don't delete function uh, in in Azure or for your resources. So an Azure policy where you can't delete. Uh, is very nice, especially for your production environment, because you don't want those uh, resources uh, at least to be deleted. That will be very bad. Um, so add that as well to the critical uh, at least resources that you that you have that you don't want to be deleted by a platform admin that just went rogue or a user that got a little bit more access than uh, they really should have. That has also happened. And then we have the master of coins. Um, and uh, just like I said earlier, um, this uh, policy can enable you to have full control over the cost. It will also uh, um, um, notify you if you have reached uh, a set of limit for cost for a month or for a, tip, a, a resource type or a resource group. So that's also very nice. Now we know that for the data engineers and the AI and ML engineers that are working in Databricks, a huge cluster is really nice. It also costs a lot of money. So if they are able to, to ramp up the cluster, um, at least we get notified uh, before the end of the month bill uh, and then get the huge surprise. That's also uh, a very neat, uh, neat feature that you should add to your tenant. And then the final is queen of specifications. So it's kind of similar to the region dictator. Uh, it entails that you can uh, specify certain uh, characteristics uh, that you want your resources to have in the tenant. So for instance, for SQL databases, if you want a specific uh, amount of CPU or a specific amount of storage, then uh, that will be a requirement for you to be able to um, create your resource. So also a very nice, um, nice way to uh, to enforce um, organizational standards um, and also making sure that the resources that are created are as similar as possible to the already established resources within uh, your tenant that should be or should have the same characteristics. That's the uh, that that's the intention here. All right, so let's just uh, let that sit in a bit. Um, I would also be so bold. <laughs> I know that some people are going to uh, bang their heads against the wall now, but bear with me. Uh, I would also be so bold uh, as to say that uh, using Azure policies the right way for your tenant might be uh, or should be or is <laughs> um, 
a soft step towards uh, using infrastructure as code. Now, this session won't cover infrastructure as code, but uh, the point with infrastructure as code is to make sure that your tenant uh, for specific resources have the same um, the same specifications, the same characteristics, uh, the naming is correct. Uh, it's within the correct region. It has the tags that it needs and so on. And if you just hear me list up things now, you also see that they're on this slide. So if you're not comfortable with starting with infrastructure as code right away when you begin your um, cloud platform journey, then Azure policy is a nice way to do it. Uh, and it hasn't be uh, it doesn't have to be that or feel that techy uh, as infrastructure as code can uh, feel. So yeah, um, that's just my opinion, but I am fairly confident with that opinion. <laughs> All right. So what did we learn today? Uh, we had four topics. Uh, we talked about first and foremost, how we structured our single tenant. There were three pitfalls that we mentioned, and this is this is them just again. Uh, we don't want to make it too complex. Instead of a tightly coupled, we want a loosely coupled architecture where we can delete region, um, uh, where we can delete um, resource groups and subscriptions without uh, worrying about it affecting other solutions that we have and we don't want to create just to create. Um, the second topic was uh, get your access control under control, and we had six steps, uh, easy steps to, to um, fulfill in order to enhance your control. Uh, one of the biggest one I would say is the user groups for your users. Uh, that is also probably the most time consuming, but uh, also a lot of fun because you get to tag employees to groups. That's cool. It could be a, an after work uh, activity actually also. Uh, if you, yeah, if you want to do that. Uh, and uh, we looked at the naming strategy um, and the, I want you guys to remember um, Justin O'Connor and his uh, time uh, or periodic table for for uh, Azure abbreviations. It's really neat uh, and it just shows that even something that might be looked at as a little bit boring or a little bit stale still can be a lot of fun with you if you add colors. Um, and yes, remember my, Microsoft might already have the answer. You don't have to invent the wheel or start from scratch. You can get a head start with uh, what, what Microsoft already has created for you. And last but not least, we had uh, six Azure policies uh, that are really neat uh, and will uh, probably be the um, be the stepping stone into looking uh, at infrastructure as code also. And yes, these are the four topics that we covered. And um, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends, we have demystified Azure. So um, thank you all for joining this session. Uh, it's been a blast. It wasn't as um, um, uh, scary as I thought it would be at the beginning. Uh, but if you would like to give me some feedback, please scan the QR code. I will be so happy. Um, also, uh, here is the link to the form if you don't have your phone in front of you because you've been so preoccupied by my speech. Um, so you can just go into your browser on your computer as well and just fill out the form. Now, uh, do we have any questions? 